Thank you for you know, inviting me to join the community. I'm, I think I'm the first startup nation alien on this stage. <laughs> and it's really, for me, honestly, it's, uh, it's a dream uh, coming true. And so is my story about the Star Trek fantasy, um, non-invasive surgery becoming a reality. So for the last 13 years, one, three, 13 years, I've been part of an exceptional team at Insight Tech in Israel and partners around the world for taking this idea, this concept, non-invasive surgery, from the research lab to routine clinical use. And this is what I'll tell you about. 13 years, for some of you, they can empathize with that number. For me today, on this stage, it's like a second bar mitzvah experience. <laughs> yeah. So, so this, this dream is really enabled by the convergence of two known technologies. One is the force of ultrasound, and the other one is the vision enabled by magnetic resonance imaging. So let's first talk about focus ultrasound. And I hold in my hand the tissue mimicking phantom. It is made out of silicon. It is transparent. Uh, made just for you, so you see it's all intact, completely transparent, okay? I'll take you now to the acoustic lab. You see the phantom within the aquarium. This is a setup I put in the physics lab. On the right-hand side, you see an ultrasonic transducer. So the ultrasonic transducer emits basically an ultrasonic beam that focuses inside the phantom, okay? When you hear the click, this is when the energy starts to emit, and you see a lesion formed inside the phantom. OK? So everything around it is whole and intact. It's just a lesion formed inside. So think about this is in your brain. We need to reach a target inside the brain. We can do it without harming any tissue. So this is, I think, the first kosher Hippocratic <laughs> surgical system. <laughs> Okay, so, so let's talk a little bit about ultrasound, the force of ultrasound. You know all about imaging, right? Ultrasound imaging. And you know also about lithotripsy, right? Breaking, uh, breaking kidney stones. But ultrasound can be shaved to be uh, anything in between because it's, it's a mechanical uh, force. Basically, it's a force acting on a tissue that it transverses. So you can change the intensity, the frequency, the duration, the pulse shape of the ultrasound to create anything from an airbrush you know, to a hammer. Okay? And I am going to show you multiple applications in the medical field that can be enabled just by focusing, physically focusing. Okay, so this idea of harnessing focused ultrasound to treat lesions in the brain is not new at all. It's when I was born, this idea was already conceived by pioneers such as the Fry brother and Lars Lexell, who is known actually as the inventor of the gamma knife. But you may not know that he tried to perform lobotomies in the brain non-invasively uh, with focused ultrasound in the 50s. He failed, so he then invented the gamma knife. And it makes you ponder, you know, why, why those pioneers fail? And there was something fundamental that they were missing. They were missing the vision. It wasn't until the invention of the MR and really the integration of MR with focused ultrasound that we could get the feedback, both the anatomical and the physiological, in order to have a completely non-invasive, closed-loop surgical procedure. Okay. So this is how it looks, you know, the operating room of the future today, okay? This is an MR suite with a focused ultrasound system. And I'll give several examples. So the first one is in the brain. One of the neurological conditions that can be treated with focused ultrasound are movement disorders like Parkinson or essential tremor. What is typical to those conditions uh, for essential tremor, for example, is uh, inability to uh, drink or eat cereal or soup without spilling everything all over you, or write legibly so people can understand it, and be really independent in your life uh, without the, the help of others. So I'd like you to meet 
John. John is a retired professor of history from Virginia. So he suffered from essential tremor for many years, and uh, medication didn't help him anymore, and, and many of those patients refused to undergo surgery to have people cut into the brain. And about four or five months ago, he uh, underwent an experimental procedure. It, it is approved under uh, an FDA IDE at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville, using focused ultrasound to ablate a point in his thalamus, okay? And this is his handwriting on June 20th, if you can read it, 2011, okay? This is his handwriting in the morning of the treatment, before going into DMR. So now I'll take you through how a typical procedure like that looks like, how non-invasive surgery looks, looks like. So we put the patient on an MR table, we attach a transducer, in this case to the brain, but if it will be a different organ, it will be a different transducer attached to the uh, patient. And the physician will then take a, a regular MR scan, okay? And the objective of that, I don't have a pointer here, but you see the green sort of rectangle or trapez. This is a sort of a general area of the treatment. It's a safety boundary around the target. It's a target in the thalamus, okay? So once those pictures are acquired and the physician has drawn, you know, all the necessary safety limits and so on, he selects basically a point. You see the round point in the middle where the cursor is? And he presses this blue button called sonicate. We call this instance of injecting the energy, we call it sonication. The only handwork the physician does here is moving a mouse. This is the only device he needs in this treatment. So he presses sonicate, and this is what happens. You see the transducer, the light blue. There's water in between the skull and the transducer, and it does this burst of energy. It elevates the temperature. We first need to verify that we are on target, right? So the first sonication is at low energy. It doesn't do any damage, but it elevates the temperature by a few degrees. And one of the unique capabilities that we leverage with the MR is the ability to measure temperature non-invasively. Okay, this is really a unique capability uh, of the MR. It's not, it, it is not being used in, in regular diagnostic imaging. But here, we can get both the anatomical imaging and the temperature maps in real time. And you can see the points there on the graph. The temperature was raised to 43 degrees temporarily. This doesn't cause any damage. But the point is we are right on target. So once the physician verifies that the focal spot is on the target that he has chosen, then we can move to perform you know, a full energy uh, ablation like you see here, and you see the temperature rises to like 55 to 60 degrees. If you do it for more than a second, it's enough to basically uh, uh, destroy the uh, proteins, the cells. This is the outcome from a patient perspective. Same day after the treatment, okay? This is an immediate relief, an immediate relief. Thank you. John is one of, of like dozen very uh, heroic, courageous people who volunteer for the study. And you have to understand, you know, what is in people's mind when, when they are willing to take the risk. And this is a quote from John after he wrote it. He said, miraculous. And his wife said, this is the happiest moment of my life. And you wonder why. I mean. One of the messages I'd like to carry over is what about defending quality of life? I mean, those people lose their independence. They are dependent on others. And, and John today is fully independent. He returned to normal life routine, and he's also played golf like you do in, in Virginia, right? When you are uh, you know, retired. Okay, so you can see here the spot, it's like three millimeters in the middle of the brain. There's no damage outside. He suffers from no neural deficit. There's no recovery needed, no nothing. He's back to his normal life. Let's move now to a more painful subject. Pain is something that can make your life miserable. 
And people are suffering from all kinds of pain, like neuropathic pain, lower back pain, and cancer pain from bone metastases, when it, you know, the metastases get to your brain. Sometimes they are uh, very painful. All of those indications have already been shown uh, to be successfully treated by uh, focused ultrasound, relieving the pain, again, very fast. And I would like to tell you about um, PJ. Uh, he's a 78 years um, farmer who suffered from, how should I say, it? it's called pain in the butt. He had a metastasis in his right buttock, buttock and, and he couldn't see it, even with medication. He had to forego, you know, about all the farmer, uh, farm activities. Uh, he was uh, treated with radiation therapy, state-of-the-art radiation therapy, but it didn't help. Many patients like that failed radiation therapy. And again, he volunteered to a pivotal study uh, that we run uh, worldwide, also in the U.S. And um, his wife actually uh, took him, they drove like three hours from their farm to the hospital. He had to sit on a, on a cushion, stand still, I mean, not to move because it was very painful. He took the treatment, and uh, on the way uh, back, he drove the car, the truck, by himself. So again, this is an immediate relief, and, and you have to understand what you know, those people feel and what their family uh, experience when it happens. Uh, he returned again to you know, his daily routine in the farm and rides his tractor. He rides his horse to their mountain cabin uh, regularly, and uh, he has been very happy. But now, you ask me, you know, but what about war? You know, the war on cancer. Show us some primary cancer. What can be done there? So I have good news and bad news. The good news, there's a lot that can be done, and it has been shown actually outside of the U.S. And doing that in the U.S. is, is very painful. I mean, I, I don't see without, you know, this nation taking it as a, as a something collective will or something that is a national goal to make that happen, it will not happen. And it's not just because of regulation. It's because of the amount of money needed under the current you know, evidence-based medicine and the size of trials and so on uh, to, to make it happen. So the first two applications are breast cancer and prostate cancer. They were the first to be treated by focused ultrasound. And uh, we have better than surgery uh, results in breast, but I have a message for the men here. We heard yesterday, Guillen, uh, talking about the uh, adverse event rate in prostate cancer. There is a unique opportunity now with focused ultrasound guided by MR because we can actually think about prostate lumpectomy, treating just the focal lesion and not removing the whole gland, and by that, avoiding all the issues with potency and, and continence. Well, there are other, uh, you know, cancer tumors in the abdomen, quite little, very little actually, pancreas, liver, kidney. The challenge there with a breathing and awake patient, and in all our treatment, the patient is awake and conscious and he speaks with the physician, um, is you have to learn, uh, teach the MR some tricks, how to uh, do it in real time. And um, this will take time. This will take two years. But I have now a message to the ladies. And this is, uh, in 2004, the FDA has approved MR-guided focused ultrasound for the treatment of symptomatic uterine fibroids. Uh, women suffer from that uh, disease, or those tumors, have uh, heavy bleeding during period, abdominal pressure, back pain, frequent urination. And sometimes that cannot, they cannot even conceive and become pregnant because of the fibroid. This is Frances. She was diagnosed with a grapefruit-sized fibroid. This is a big fibroid. She was offered hysterectomy. But this is an inconceivable proposition for someone who wants to keep her pregnancy option. 
So she elected to undergo a focused ultrasound procedure in 2008, and in 2010, she became the first time mother to a healthy baby. So new life was born. So in, in conclusion, I, I'd like to leave you with, with actually four messages. One is, think about the amount of suffering that is saved from patients undergoing non-invasive surgery. And also the economical and emotional burden removed from their families and communities and the society uh, at large. And uh, I think also from their physicians, by the way. And the other thing I would like you to think about is the new type of relationship between physician and patients when you have a patient on the table which is awake and can monitor even you know, the treatment. In all our treatment, the patient holds a stop sonication button. He can stop the surgery you know, at any moment. And uh, with that note, I would like to thank you for listening.